Hello! Welcome back to the Regeneron Science Talent Search Public Exhibition of Projects. I'm still Christine Yi, winner of last year's competition, and next up, I'm so excited to talk with some amazing young scientists with really cool health projects. Up first, Neil. Neil, tell us about your research on RNA structure and what it means for diagnosing diseases. Thank you. So my research focused on predicting RNA secondary structure using unassigned chemical, sh chemical shifts. Chemical shifts are a type of data collected through a method called NMR spectroscopy. And using that, we can reweight a conformational ensemble of RNA structures so that it better agrees with experiments. And we can have a better idea of how the RNA looks and the different states through which it uh, cycles because RNA is at its heart a dynamic thing. The research can be used in many ways in the medical field. First of all, it can be used to understand both RNA function, structure and function in physiological and pathological states. For example, uh, cancer and lupus both have are, are uh, caused in a, uh, in, to some extent at least by misformed uh, mis uh, RNA, microRNA segments, and by understanding how that formation exists and how we can correct it, we can understand how to treat these diseases. It also gives us an idea of how to tackle some emerging pathogens like SARS-CoV-2, Nipah virus, and Ebola, all of, which are, uh, all of which are RNA viruses, and all of which have, um, now, some of which have now had some treatment approaches. But through RNA, we can approach them in a different way and hopefully try to make a change. Thank you. Amazing. My next question is for Nolan. Nolan, you researched hydrogels. First of all, what are hydrogels? Second of all, what impacts could your research have on organ transplant? Thank you. So first, a hydrogel is a water-based material that's actually very prevalent in a lot of day-to-day -day products, such as hair gels, hair products, and also contact lenses. Um, I studied the effect of hydrogels for different applications, such as tissue regeneration and also drug delivery. So hydrogels are mainly, most of, mainly ma made out of water and contain different polymers, such as synthetic or also natural polymers. So after creating and developing my hydrogel, I wanted to test its effect on different properties, such as the compressive strength, how much I was able to stretch the hydrogel, tensile strength, the stability, and also the inner microstructure of the hydrogel. In terms of its applications in um, transplants, Hydrogels act, can act as an artificial environment that actually promote tissue regeneration and act as a scaffold. However, currently, these hydrogels have limitations, such as um, it's unable to treat large defects. So by using my hydrogels or hydrogels that are developed in the future, they could possibly treat de bigger defects and possibly even be used for organ transplants. Awesome, thank you so much. Let's talk to Jeffrey next. Jeffrey, you're interested in exploring the intersections between immunology and oncology. Tell us about what you found. Sure. Thank you, Christine. So let me begin by explaining the two terms. So immunology is the study of the immune system, or basically how our body is able to combat diseases and infections. And oncology is the study of cancer, which is a disease that arises from our own cells. So cancers are actually able to use properties of the immune system to their advantage. So let me give you an example. One protein I studied is CCR6, which is involved in cell migration and it helps immune cells move towards sites of infections. However, cancers can use that same exact protein to help it grow and expand. So by understanding the complexity of the immune system and the different components of it, we can then use that information to better understand how cancers work and how we can exploit properties of the immune system to thus treat cancer. Amazing. Now I want to talk to Ambika, whose research could have a major impact on treating ischemic strokes. First of all, what are ischemic strokes? And second, how could your research change that, their treatment? Sure. So an ischemic stroke is when an artery becomes partially or completely blocked due to the presence of a blood clot, and that restricts the movement of oxygen, glucose, and other valuable nutrients from reaching the brain. So my research focuses on a new way to treat ischemic strokes by updating something known as tissue plasminogen activator, or TPA, which was first approved by the FDA in 1996. But how my approach is different is that it basically uses peptides that are specific to platelets and fibrin to localize a microbubble structure, which then serves two purposes. 
The first is to actively break apart a blood clot, and the second is to deter something that we know uh, is called the coagulation cascade, which is a mechanism by which a clot is rebuilt. So my research holds promise for the treatment of ischemic strokes in emergency settings, but can also be applied to other diseases as they pertain to blood clots. Thank you so much. Next up is Ryan. Ryan, can you tell us about your study on nerve cells and mitochondria? What are the implications of your finding? Yeah, definitely. So the brain, you know, has a lot of cells, and these cells are called neurons. Now you have billions and billions of these neurons, and if most of these neurons, there's a unique phenomenon called structural plasticity. And it's the idea that your brain and these neurons are constantly changing their shape, size, location all the time. Now, you can imagine that this is a very energetic process that requires a lot of energy. And so I'm interested in understanding how mitochondria play a role in structural plasticity. And what I find is that with impaired mitochondria and impaired energy production, that there's actually an impact on structural plasticity. Cells are no longer as plastic and they can't uh, move around as much as they used to. I also find that there's a loss of synapses. And this is important because synapses is how your neurons communicate. Without synapses, your brain or these neurons cannot function properly. Now this is really important because both the loss of structural plasticity as well as the loss of synapses are often implicated together in lots of neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's. And so my results help pave a way for potential therapeutic um, approaches to uh, treating these neurodegenerative disorders. Awesome. And now we'll turn our attention to Lyndon, who works with caterpillars to find a potential new way to treat traumatic brain injuries. What were your conclusions, Lyndon? Yeah, so I don't know if you're familiar with traumatic brain injuries, but they're very prevalent. They are, um, are responsible for around one third of all injury related deaths. And part of this is because a lot of the current TBI care strategies revolve around preventative measures rather than treatment methods. So I wanted to create a new model organism for traumatic brain injuries that could be very accessible for beginning researchers and one that I could test my idea that a thyroid hormone could be a great treatment for TBI on. So I found that Galeria melanella are very effective models for traumatic brain injury and that the caterpillar equivalent of a human thyroid hormone called T3 is very, very effective at treating the signs of traumatic brain injury. I also found that a specific molecule in the brain in both caterpillars and humans is very interesting and heavily involved in traumatic brain injury recovery. And so I'm really interested in seeing how it is implicated in other neurological conditions. Amazing. And finally, over to Samantha, who also studied traumatic brain injuries. Samantha, you looked at the connection between the body's immune reaction and traumatic brain injury. What did your research find? Thank you for that question. Like Lyndon mentioned, traumatic brain injuries are responsible for over 30% of all injury-related deaths, and current interventions only manage the symptoms and aren't reparative. Yet recent research has focused on addressing this by linking TBI tissue damage with blood-brain barrier disruption. So in my study, I looked at a specific cascade of this blood-brain barrier disruption involving proteins called matrix proteinases, and I used a new 3D model developed by my mentor's lab to model a dysfunctional blood-brain barrier and my results showed that inhibiting the production of a specific matrix proteinase, MMP9, can prevent blood-brain barrier dysfunction after a traumatic brain injury. And these results are extremely important because matrix proteinases are involved in other neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, Huntington's, and even addiction. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you to these awesome finalists who are making me feel so great about the future of medicine. Learn more about their awesome projects on our public exhibitions webpage, which is linked in the Society for Sciences bio, and meet our next wave of amazing, science, of amazing scientists in just a few minutes. Thank you.